when we talk to a conservation organization and we try to scope the type of data that we want to access and then show in this ecological assets, this proof of contribution. We try to ask for the most relevant, so we want to try to minimize the type of data that we give access to, to normal people with, because mm. sometimes it's overwhelming and sure. it's not necessary to access everything. So what is the most relevant piece of data that we can access that mm. tells us something about the, the health of the ecological focus you have? Not mm. only the species itself, but yeah. maybe their focus, their ecological focus is on a community, so mm. the relationships between different species in an ecosystem. So we access the most relevant data. It can be uh, data about an indicator species. So a jaguar in the Amazon is an indicator species. That yeah. If you know there's enough of them, there's a healthy population of them, you know that all the way down they have prey, the, the prey have enough food, that means mm. the vegetation is also doing well, right? So uh, you can use these heuristics to kind of have an understanding of the health of an ecosystem. Hey, what's going on, Refi Nation? I am super grateful to bring another episode of Refi Podcast. Today, we sit down with Alessandro Mazzi, the head of partnerships and field research at the Sovereign Nature Initiative based here in Lisbon. I have been super impressed by this organization and their pioneering thought leadership at the edges of culture, community, data, and conservation. We hear Ali's personal journey as he transitioned from a master in international law into the work of conserving nature's most precious ecosystems. We talk through a number of the pilots that they have been working, including the Kenya Wildlife Trust, bringing data around particular species, in this case lions, to gaming communities and other organizations around the world to really demonstrate the value that these specific organisms have for human and for broader planetary health. In this conversation, we start to look at the role of the human species in this broader web of life and really begin to untangle some of the thoughts and patterns that have gotten us out of right relationship that we've known for millennia in indigenous cultures around the world. It really hit me and struck me as we've seen how far and how separate we are from nature and how much we've boxed in ourselves from communities around us how we really do need to change and we have an incredible opportunity before us. As biodiversity is collapsing and cascading, we can actually become the architects of nature. They are releasing some incredibly exciting developments in partnership with Wallet Connect soon and shortly. Um, check out this episode and glimpse the frontier of biodiversity, conservation, and Web3. Hope you enjoy the show. Please do drop us a five-star review if you appreciated the content today and let us know what you think. Ale, such a pleasure to have you here, my friend. How are you arriving today? Yeah, thanks, John, for having me. It's, uh, it's been it's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a long time. And um, I'm doing okay. It's been a very, very busy time for mm. SNI. So I'm um, yeah. leaning in at the end of the, of the year and enjoying and looking forward to the next. Nice, nice, man. I remember when we first met, it was at the very beginning of my refi journey. Um, I don't know how we got in touch, but I remember... Yeah. I, I had to think about it in preparation of this conversation, and um, I think we were very much like at the beginning of our journey mm. as well with yeah. SNI, and we were launching our first uh, hackathon. Yeah. And the refi space was just starting, right? It was sprouting, yeah. and um, we got a lot of applicants and, and participants from, from that mm. space. So I think that's how we got to talk with each other, you were at Tucan at yeah. that time, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's been a long time, and like in Web3 world, it's, wow, it's man. feels like uh, two or three decades. I know, it's just two years, two years. Um, yeah. Well, I'm super excited to dive deeper into the work that you guys are doing. Um, it's really nice to come and visit your guys' amazing office here in Lisbon and be a part of some events together, but I was really struck by this moment in your TED Talk um, oh. where you describe this experience of feeling like you don't belong in the world, which is something that I've very much felt in my body since a very young age. And I remember specifically you describing searching for a new story and then at some point recognizing that actually your mind was also part of the problem and thereby wanting to drop into your body to a deeper kind of felt experience of this childlike joy and curiosity for nature that you had. And this ultimately led you to free diving, which is something that I'm actually going to start um, yeah, training with in March. So I'm like really curious. 
But uh, you had this scene of um, free diving uh, with a bunch of different fish during like a sardine run and almost like this epiphany experience that you had. Um, can you fast forward or fast back to that moment and just kind of drop us into what you were going through and what this was like for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so let me start with like yeah, belonging, right? And um, there's been a process for me uh, when I realized that um, the work that I was doing or what I was told it was the normal, let's say, was f- wasn't fitting with, with me, like mm-hmm. with intuitions I had and curiosity I, have, uh, I had since I was a child uh, to discover the natural world. I found out that we built a system that was destroying the planet mm-hmm. and was seeing us as separate from uh, all the rest of the living. So I needed to find a way to kind of like get back to that sense of, uh, you know, belonging. And I've always been a curious person in, in, in terms of like curiosity towards nature. Um, so I thought, why don't I just do something extreme like trying to pretend to be a dolphin, you know, by learning how to hold my breath and go deep. And uh, I was lucky enough to have a friend of mine in South Africa mm. that goes every year to chase the sardines and the dolphins and the sharks and the whales <laughs> that come so together cool. with it. So I, yeah, I joined him and uh, that experience very much um, brought me to really not just understand with mm-hmm. my intellect, but with my body yeah. that we are part of uh, of this natural world. Mm-hmm. Like so, dolphins communicating with me, um, and me communicating through movements wow. with them. You know, mm-hmm. just made me feel like it's actually there's another being that is as curious as I am about wow. uh, who we are. You know, mm-hmm. so these experiences brought me to to realize um, that there is a commitment that I want to, and and a lot of people I work with have the same commitment towards Mm. reconfiguring the relationship that we have with the living earth. And with the minds that we have, then, you know, create some economic systems Mm. or governance systems that are more in line and partnership with with all of the living. And we can get very concrete in what that means, but I think it's good to start with like... Yeah, yeah. Um, what's most meaningful to 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 us, and mm. I, I guess also in this ecosystem that we're trying to create of, of you know developers, uh, designers, uh, economists that are trying okay. to answer those questions. I always like to start from mm. a place of like, why are we doing this? And I think mm. this understanding of we are part of this larger community, ourselves extends, and all our actions extend always. Yeah. To, to include to include others. Um, from that perspective, then we can start to build, you know, better future, better technology, economy, and so on. But so let's nice. just start from there. And there's also a seemingly shift in consciousness. You describe the mammalian dive reflex as effectively lowering your heart rate and changing the way that your body responds in water. And for me, I've definitely found um, these kind of altered states of consciousness through even deep rest can allow you to really resonate with nature in ways that are hard to achieve when we're super stressed out, running around all the time with our hands and our phone. Um, so maybe later in the episode we can kind of yeah dive into some of your practices and how you really maintain this anchor to a broader awareness of self as being an intricate part of nature, as separate from it. But why don't we open up this dialogue around you know why biodiversity, why conservation, why does this actually matter? Sure. Um... I mean, it's to to some uh, cultures, I guess, this is very obvious why why a thriving environment around us uh, it's it's good for for humans, right? Um, for let's say Western the Western mind, there was at some point in history um, separated from the natural world. There needs to be some sort of like rekindling of the the why it is, it is so important. But basically, if we want to get down to uh, to the science, mm. right? So we are understanding now that biodiversity offers a lot of what we call services mm. in the Western world, or or you know things that is, is offered to us in terms of safety, health. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, the World Bank. I think came up with this half of the GDP, whatever uh, is is dependent on biodiversity on the health of biodiversity. We know that biodiversity loss is, 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 is 
the planetary boundary that was mostly mm. crossed, right? We're, yeah. going be, we're beyond that. We're talking about six mass, mass extinction. Yeah. Yeah. The effects that biodiversity has on us, we're still finding out, right? So you have um, new science looking <laughs> like the, the health of the guts and the, bi- yeah, and the diversity of the guts and how that relates to the bi- biodiversity outside of our body mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and how less bacteria, less diversity is actually influencing the health, uh, our physical health, but then as mm. uh, consequences on the health of our uh, um, minds and totally. our capacity to cognitively, mm. you know, uh, our cognitive functions. Let's say so. Mm, mm. Um, biodiversity is or diversity of life is uh, is what we depend on as humans, yeah. and we are the last ones to come and, and it doesn't mean that we are the most important yeah right we're actually the ones that will probably feel the consequences of biodiversity loss the most or we are mm. Mm. Um, there has been in the carbon market uh, um, discourse let's say an attempt to find a way to link the carbon cycle to biodiversity so this is mm. also uh, something that's at least in terms of storytelling has been tried to kind of show to people that protecting biodiverse ecosystem is also mm. an impact on carbon cycles, carbon storage. Yeah. Um, but this, I think, has not yet. Uh, you can see how with the, the COP, the climate COP and the biodiversity COP, the type of mm. priorities that has been given in the international um, uh realm or international sustainable development realm is yeah. biodiversity is still not made it to uh, having stage. having uh, priority in, in policy mm. because I believe and we can get into that maybe later but because the measurements are very hard yes so if we uh, are obsessed continuously with measuring 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 the exact health what does health mean what does it's going to uh, we're going to be too slow to then, you know, funnel the capital that mm. we actually want to funnel towards biodiversity, conservation and restoration. Yeah, it's such an interesting framing, you know, beginning the conversation with, you know, a sense of I don't belong here in this mechanized, industrialized world, extracting all of nature and killing, you know, much of life on the planet. And we can experience it, like you said, in the health of our gut, but also in the health of our minds. And, and the experience of what it's like to live in a community, in a concrete jungle, where nobody looks at each other in the eyes. And you don't wake up to the bird songs, you wake up to the sound of a horn. You know, this is a real onslaught on our experience of what it means to be human. And yet there's this trap, it seems, where the economic system and its abstract value of all these different things is really struggling to figure out how to accurately value nature because, like you described, our obsession with measuring stuff. And at the same time, I know you know some of the work that you guys are doing at Sovereign Nature Initiative is very much squarely situated, you know, in data around biodiversity mm. and conservation, exposing this and making it part of culture, of games and art and community. So, if you would, I would be really curious to hear you describe the work that Sovereign Nature Initiative is doing and kind of the core theory of change behind this and how mm. we can balance these different drivers and seeming paradoxes to actually move the planet towards a more you know, healthy and diverse and yeah, balanced place. Yeah, sure. So, let's, uh, let's place us and what we do in, in the context of, let's say, the what is now called or widely referred to as the voluntary contributions towards nature positive efforts. So okay. this is the the framing um, or the, the 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 world realm milieu that we are part of, which mm. has into it uh, um, very different aspects from biodiversity credits to biodiversity markets to nature capital. And um, what we uh, are trying to do, and the market is not there yet, right? So like it's all very new. Yeah. Um, but basically, what is um, what are the questions in that that we're trying to tackle through technology and through methodologies that we are developing? Is how does the private sector find where does the private sector find value in 
a voluntary contribution mm-hmm. where there's no direct return Interesting. to be expected yet, right? There's no yeah. financial return, at least, so on the mm-hmm. on the capital that I've put into this um, um, into a project, for instance, that sure. I'm trying to support. Um, through our research, the value that corporations or the private sector in general can also be a community, right, mm-hmm. online, mm-hmm. and this is why Web3, we can get <laughs> to that later on. <laughs> but um, let's say, talking about corporations now, what they find very valuable about having a proof for, of a claim they're making, of you know, mm-hmm. a project they've supported, is that that brings... Um, Retention in terms of employ- uh, employees, customers, brand value, right? So look at Patagonia, for mm. instance, and how much value they got and how much community. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much community they have created around yeah. around the brand, around the message, right? Mm. So this is the type of value they, they find. And for them, it can be translated at some point as financial value, you know, getting more customers and so on. Now for now is like about getting the trust of the public, mm. of the users, of the consumers on the claims that they're making. Yeah. Um, then we can get into the beyond uh, beyond the corporate uh, value that they find that the private sector finds, which extends to citizens as well. So mm. with the technologies that we're uh, the, we're developing, basically you're able as an individual to have continuous dynamic life access to the impact that this project that you support it yeah. is having on the ground. Super cool. And you mentioned data, right? So yes, data basically gives us the connection between a, a contribution that someone mm-hmm. made financial contribution towards a project and the actual data that this project collects to inform yeah. their operations, mm-hmm. their strategies and to report on the outcomes of, of the actions and strategies. So we have this both learning, so someone that holds this asset that proves that the contribution went to support biodiversity restoration or conservation. They can access um, what does the data mean to the, what we call ecological steward, mm-hmm. the organization mm-hmm. itself, how is informing their work, and how can I check whether they've reached the outcome that they promised us to reach. And if they didn't, it's not a big deal. They yeah. can explain you why. So sure, sure. on the data side, we've also complemented it with uh, what we call the um, steward feed, which is a more qualitative way of reporting, which is basically done through content uh, rich information like videos, photos, cool. inter- short interviews from, from the field, from nice. the ground of these organizations. Super interesting. Yeah. They do the, they do the work and it, the more raw and unpolished, the better, right? So, like, I want people to get, and we can get into that as well, yeah. like, on the realness and the roughness of the work of mm. these people. And um, now, so we want contributors to biodiversity restoration and conservation to feel part of that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we can get into, you know, what, uh, what the theory of change um, of each project that we're faci- you know that we're supporting how we guide them through through that if you want sure yeah um, and to unpack yeah so basically just to recap yeah. briefly here so um, the the kind of key premise is that um, humans actually do value nature and that there's this increasing wave of awareness about the importance of nature and the pain that we're experiencing at an individual level and a societal level. And we've seen that brands who really lean into, you know, having a positive impact and doing it with integrity are actually building a type of, you know, social capital and brand trust and loyalty um, and even sometimes a premium as a result of that difference that they're making in the world alongside a competitor who is making no difference, Patagonia being an example. And that actually um, data itself and the ability to verify you know, the impact that these organizations are having on the ground is a really key piece of the puzzle, going back to that whole measurement aspect. And it sounds like you guys are dancing with different types of data. You have the more structured data, the kind of quantified um, field surveys, you know, probably, uh, you know, exactly where it is on the map and who's uh, 
calculated it, at what point in time, and you're also building what sounds like a more social and kind of dynamic feed of stewardship on the ground to create a richer platform, mm-hmm. probably also you know to tell stories and engage communities at a deeper level. Um, is that a fair kind of summation of what you described? Did I miss anything? Let's let me ground it to with examples of the type of data, right? So what we collect usually we work with what we call ecological stewards, with our, mm-hmm. which are organizations. And at times, these organizations extend to local communities as well. So they mm-hmm. hire local communities <laughs> to do the conservation work. Um, and is species, mostly species-specific data. Okay. Right. So you can think of uh, what is called signs of presence. So tracks, scats, uh, like fishes, and um, or camera traps, bioacoustics. This gives you an understanding of what, bi- what wildlife is mm-hmm. present in this ecosystem. Yeah. Um, direct observations, rangers go out, this is another type of thing, where they see the animal, they record that this animal was there, what type of behavior was it, uh, it showing, and yeah. then you have more like advanced GPS tracking, where then there's a device put on okay. specific animals to, for instance, if it's on a, um, um, if you want to track a population of elephants, you will put that uh, that uh, color on right. a female, like okay. the matriarch, because the matriarch is the one guiding the <laughs> guiding the herd. So you will follow a certain group of population mm-hmm. of elephants this way. Uh, right now, satellites are becoming coming closer and closer, as you as you know, I think, uh, to to the ground. So wow. it might be that soon we will be able to access very cheap type of mm. uh, uh, data or open source data about uh, wildlife. Wow. Which raises a lot of questions, of course. Sure. But um, but yeah, and uh, eDNA is another very exciting mm. um, type of data we will get very soon from these organizations, um, which will give you a, again a very um, economic, econo- economically efficient way to do environmental assessment. So by simply collecting samples from soil to water, well, that would then give you an understanding of what biodiversity is out there because it takes very small traces of DNA that some wow. animals left in, in, in the air and then it is deposited in water. E stands for environmental DNA. That's so, so this cool. is really cool and um, yeah, this is the type of data that we play with. Mm. But now when we talk to a conservation organization and we try to scope the type of data that we want to access and then show in this ecological assets, this proof of contribution, we try to ask for the most relevant, so we want to try to minimize the type of data that we give access to to normal people with, because mm-hmm. sometimes it's overwhelming and sure. it's not necess- necessary to access everything. So what is the most relevant piece of data that we can access that mm-hmm. tells us something about the, the health of the ecological focus you have, the population that you're trying to, to, to conserve? It can be <clears throat> at a community level too, right? So not mm-hmm. only the species itself, but yeah. maybe th- their focus, their ecological focus is on a community, so mm-hmm. the relationships between different species in an ecosystem. Um, so we access the most relevant data. It can be a data about an indicator species. So a jaguar in the Amazon is an indicator species. That yeah. If you know there's enough of them, there's a healthy population of them, you know that all the way down they have prey, the, the prey have enough food, that means mm, the vegetation is also doing well, right? So uh, you can use these heuristics to kind of um, have an understanding of the health of an ecosystem. Then from there, we ask them, what is also data that is uh, educational, right? So what I was just saying is like, how through this data about, let's say, a lion in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a Manzamara ecosystem, how does that inform you about the health of the ecosystem? How can we tell that story to, to you know, uh, a lay person to yeah. understand the role of, of the species that you're protecting for the ecosystem? Mm. This is why you find in our language that we use a lot the uh, ecological, right? So the eco- e- 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 ecology is means you know the relationship of the the house, the the, or the relationships that make up the house, right? The the home that we mm. where we live in. So the stewards that we protect, we always see them as stewards of the relationships that make up the ecosystem, and not necessarily a single population. Yeah. So we also always want to extend uh, their the scope of what they do to to 
to the wider, more holistic um, uh, picture that we can give to someone. Because sometimes, you know, like you, in the past, conservation has been seen as protecting the, the cool, pretty animals, yeah. which has never been that for scientists. Like <laughs> they knew that what they were doing and that what they're doing is to actually protect the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Which includes humans. So we can go mm-hmm. into that as well. Interesting. So, but with this, let's say, data that is relevant, educational, and empathy rich, mm-hmm. we like to say. So it's like, how can we, how can this data also connect people from the heart? Yeah. Understanding, for instance, through listening to a bioacoustics of whales, right? Like, mm-hmm. how can they connect with the mystery, the beauty of, 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 a, of, of that species? So mm-hmm. we try to do that. Um, through data, right? Through very raw data. Um, one of the things that we also do with the data, for instance, what we did with the the Musama, the uh, uh, crowd crowdfunding uh, project, is to look at how can we produce something a derivative of that data that is. Um, appealing to the community mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. will receive this asset. So with them was gaming, right? So yeah. we, we took a catalog of lions from the Masai Mara, of okay. 400 lions individually. Masai Mara being? In Kenya. In Kenya. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. Uh, sure. in, in Kenya, greater Masai Mara ecosystem okay. is yeah. one of the most yeah diverse ecosystems in uh, Eastern Africa um, and has predators of... Uh, big big cats and wild dogs <laughs> okay. and it's very wild um, it's one of the most visited um, tourist uh, uh, okay. you know safari places in the world so you took a collection of 400 lions from the Masai Mara for this community um, yeah Monsama. for this gaming community yeah Monsama we created uh, together with them in partnership with them 400 avatars of this okay. lion, of this real existing lions yeah um, that these avatars have then been created are NFTs that will be used within the game for, uh-huh, for their own uh-huh. game mechanics. So this was like a way to show and each NFT that is used within the game includes this proof of contribution, right? right. So, um, so our question there is like how can we make these assets that we are creating which again gives you proof of a contribution supporting conservation and so on also mm-hmm. be engaging for the community that sure. has been gifted or, or that is buying that are buying this this these assets which in effect i guess are in game assets right these are in game assets yeah and i'm curious what was the response of this gaming community and like what were they using these in game lion avatars for like what was the purpose Sure. Um, actually, this is um, uh, evolving. Um, there will be soon a release of the adult uh, cool. lions that will show basically all these features that the conservation organization uses to identify. Cool. This is, you know, Sam, this is Carface, this is <laughs> it, right? And I'll get to like why this is important um, um, to know individual lions. But basically, what what uh, what they're going to be using it is as a companion to their mm. existing uh, uh, um, assets that they're using. So they will be giving to these gamers extra yeah. powers. Okay, interesting. One interesting thing that we've done, because we were not just happy with like, all right, you get these cool avatars that have the characteristics of existing living lions in the wild, but we wanted mm. these communities that are very far away from the actual grounds, yeah. uh, the, you know, the topics of biodiversity, biodiversity restoration, sure, conservation, sure. the challenges of conservation and so on, to learn about it. Mm. So we thought, mm. how do you do, how do we do that? Um, we will soon be launching this um, uh, with them, but basically we will get them to answer certain questions mm. about lion ecology, um, nice. conservation work specifically in the, of the Masai Mara for them to be able to unlock Nice. certain cool. powers up, uh, that comes game. from yeah within the game nice. and this is just like to you know get again the world to understand the the importance of this work mm. and the importance of this species beyond their beauty beyond what they what they represent to us uh, yeah. in terms of you know the the images that we have from Walt mm. Disney movies and so on like what is it really what is it yeah uh, 
means in, to life. Um, totally. Yeah. And I'm curious to even follow that thread because as I was looking at this focus on the species of lions in particular, you mentioned earlier how predators have this kind of proxy for ecosystem health as a whole. Because if you know there's presence of, you mentioned earlier, jaguars, um, that the rest of the food chain effectively is um, strong enough to support that population. But what happens, say, if all the lions in the Mazamara were to be destroyed? Like, what would happen to the ecosystem, and also how would this affect human he- health? Well, I guess, and I'm not an ecologist, so I won't try to sure. pretend to, to yeah, do that. Yeah, but you course. know, like, it's pretty. I think it's it, it can also become pretty obvious to people if you think about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No lions it means prey wants prey numbers, mm-hmm. while prey numbers won't be on check, hence yeah. they might be starting to overgraze yeah. the land. Yeah. Uh, it might be that desertification happened and these animals will probably die um, mm. because of, yeah, they don't have enough and, uh, uh, enough food. enough resources for themselves. Des- desertification is happening. Disease might be spreading, hence yeah. like... Um, Humans around might also start to use, in the case of the Mazaymara, cattle. And this has mm. happened actually in the past, where okay. you know, this is from the wild, yeah. wild beast, wild wildebeest was, um, it was infected uh, cows and cattle. Okay. Cattle. Uh, With some kind of disease. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the type of things that can happen. So the mm. uh, trophic cascades and all the way down to, to us. If we live our lives mostly sitting in rooms um, uh, behind screens, we don't necessarily see what, uh, why mm. nature is important until yeah. it shows up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in 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 our in our doorstep with climate change, with you know news that uh, mm. reach us to say like, well, if we don't fix our soil. Uh, we won't have any any produce in the next you know twenty thirty years, <laughs> and the relationship of biodiversity to that is something that we're only you know recently at least is coming to public uh, awareness right yeah. now. So yeah. we see calls from the United Nations, from corporate partners uh, of of these international organizations that say basically we need billions mm. to be funneled to towards biodiversity conservation done in a way that is different from um, from what we've done in the past of excluding humans from from these protected areas, right? So um, it's a big, and this is why the amount of money that is needed is, is, is big because you need to mm. be able to ensure that these human settlements around biodiverse areas or the buffer zones of these biodiverse areas are also taken into account, the livelihoods yeah. of these people. Yeah, I mean, the UN recently, uh, actually, in the targets of the biological, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity in Target 19, is there is this 200 billion per year by 2030 as a, as a target to be, you know, yeah. the money that we want to raise. And the private sector is the hope Gosh. that, uh, you know, that they will, um, they will be able to pull that off and... Um, what I would say with Sovereign Nature Initiative, we're trying to really carve a space for ourselves is like, how can we incentivize corporations to um, contribute, yeah. their, their fi- uh, financially contribute to biodiversity restoration and conservation without any market-based mechanism? Yeah, so, totally, I see this. You know, yeah. And I think the community building, participation of, co- of communities, the customer base with these claims with these contributions that are making uh, that are nature positive uh, call them more biodiverse mm. uh, positive towards biodiversity how can this become um, something that is valuable to them yeah. to the customers and um, yeah so it's it's a big question you know but I think this is where we want to move towards until maybe at some point a market might be able to price value nature in the correct way but until that's not there, and I think we're yeah. This is a kind of a far. segue. Yeah, I mean, you can see the Vera. You know, you know that world. I think uh, uh, Vera is coming up with a nature framework mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to sort of you know create their own methodology on how to value the outcomes of 
uh, on nature positive outcomes and mm. efforts uh, of projects, but um, we'll see. You know, the, the, the sounds very complex what they're trying to 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 make, and totally. I think maybe not necessary, but we'll see. You mentioned some pretty significant capital flows, two hundred billion dollars a year um, towards biodiversity and nature. I know that there was also the $100 billion a year um, from Paris on loss and damages, which hasn't seemed to materialize. Um, but it sounds like you've made some really nice progress funneling capital to these conservation projects through these pilots that you've done. Give us an overview, if you will, of how much money that you guys have raised for these organizations and what did you learn about what was effective in raising capital um, for funding conservation in this way? Yeah, so um, right now... Um, and I'm very bad with math, but I think we have raised around uh, hundred uh, between 150 and 160,000 for uh, four organizations. So cool. Um, and it's been interesting to see how much you know. Also, small funds. So, for instance, for one organization, we we have raised 15,000 euros. And the feedback on that, mm. when I was like, almost like being like, you know, it's not a significant amount of fun right now, but hopefully, you know, yeah. we'll be able to raise more for you in the future. He said, Ale, you know, this is the head scientist, like, you have no idea how wow. much 15,000 means to us. And I can tell you exactly why. He's going to, in the next, so by the end of 2025, with the extra monitoring of uh, of whales uh, in Martinique, so in the French Caribbean, uh, with the extra monitoring that he will be able to support through the funding, uh, mm -hmm. which includes you know uh, new hydrophones, gasoline for the boat, salaries for an extra researcher. He wants to produce uh, a scientific paper that then mm -hmm. will be able. He's convinced because he's done it in the past to uh, influence policy and laws locally to basically reduce the amounts of boats, whale watching boats and also mm. vessels that can cross mm. the areas where these whales uh, live in the ocean. So he uh, was able to produce uh, uh, and, and show us evidence of him being able to, or the organization itself called AquaSearch, mm -hmm. has been able to do that two or three years ago and now he's like, we, need, we can do more, we can put more restrictions on how, you know, and show mm. like how the whales are reacting to boats Jeez. crossing crossing their paths, right? And through bioacoustics mostly, so they take, mm, this is the data that we access, is the acoustics that can show the stress levels wow. of, of the whales um, related to, you know, vessels being, being close by and crossing their, um, their paths. So... And this is with small amounts yet, right? So what we can do with greater amounts, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. But the point I wanted to make here is that when you get very close to uh, these organizations and the work that they do, you understand that the problem is not necessarily the size of funding, but it's like mm -hmm. actually connecting to the ones that with the smallest amounts can do the most can yeah. have the most impact yeah. yeah and i'm understanding more and more that like yeah biodiversity restoration doesn't necessarily need more money needs smarter money yeah and um and less bureaucracy like give the money to the ones doing the actual work on the yeah. ground and the last year and a half with snai ie so I'm the head of partnerships and field research, which means I'm kind of like the steward of our stewards. So I'm the one very close to them. I speak to them nice. on a weekly basis. I, w I know what they're doing. I'm getting to know all their operations and processes. And this is fundamental. It's very important. It's very hard to do impact reporting when you don't have a very strong relationship with the organizations that, you, that you're supporting, helping support. So I want to bring... That which I'm seeing, that I'm and I'm experiencing, and I'm developing with them, very close yeah. to the people that contribute to them, and it can be these corporations, right? So, how we work is, we have these ten uh, ecological stewards right now, with whom we have a contract on giving us basically the rights to access the data that yeah. we scoped. Through that, we 
reach out to corporations. So we sit in the middle between conservation mm. organizations and the private sector. Yeah. And we tell them the stories about these organizations, the different ones. And the corporate, organi- uh, uh, the corporate partner decides which ones, which organizations mm. to support based on the type of data this, they, they, they can produce, the type of stories they can tell, and the type of impact that they are, you know, that yeah. they are um, desiring, let's say. Through, um, through that then, basically, um, we, we decide the, the type of project within the scope of operations that th- these funds will be going to, um, to, to support, the type of outcomes, metrics that can be produced, the periodicity of the updates mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on you know, meeting the objective of the project. And, uh, and through this very simple theory of change connected to a specific project, we are able to bring not only the corporations, the funds, but the, the people that actually receive, which are users, customers of these organizations, they will receive these assets to get very close to the stewardship work of, mm. these, of these organizations or communities. Um, and feel part of that. So we have in, um, in the plans for next year to experiment with also online support, governance support. So decision making, for instance, mm. could be extended to these online communities that they receive these ecological assets, which are the proof of their contribution, such yeah. as we've raised 20,000 for... E- uh, for this organization, the organization can ask to the communities that c- has contributed these funds to suggest what strategies mm, they might, nice. uh, how shall we spend these twenty thousand? Three options: yeah, coloring of <laughs> of of, of uh, animals, um, an eDNA survey, sure, uh, or this, and they can to become active participants. Ex- yeah, that's really nice. Explain why. Right, mm, like why mm. would this be beneficial? Why would this be beneficial? Why yeah. would this be beneficial? You know, and in this way, you get the people to participate with uh, individuals to participate with these these efforts, and you create a community around it that so informs nice. informs the policy and also build some resilience in terms of the funding stream for these organizations. <laughs> you know, it it seems like there's this fascinating model you guys are approaching, which is. How do you bring this into human culture, knowing that most of society now lives in cities, are living increasingly digital lives? How can you surface, you know, these really nuanced but important aspects of nature that our lives literally depend upon and bring this into this new culture that's emerging and then help them become active participants in, you know, the formation of these initiatives so that they really relate to it and also, I guess, feel a sense of self in that work. Of like I am an active participant in, you know, supporting the Kenya Wildlife Trust, and there's something about me and who I am that really feels at home in this initiative. And whether it was you know liking lions growing up or just recognizing the ecological impact that this is helping to change the story of people who are probably looking for purpose and meaning in their life and struggling in various ways. So I think it's it's an interesting, a very interesting theory of change um, because so much of the rest of the refi space is kind of sorely locked into the financialized markets that are also struggling for obvious reasons. And I know nature-based solutions have taken an absolute pummeling recently, um, and yet we need nature <laughs> very clearly. There's a lot of capital going into engineered um, removals and things like this, but um, everyone intuitively knows that we don't really want to live in concrete jungles with pigs and, uh, <laughs> and chickens and cows <laughs> and nothing else. I'd be curious to get just a, a high-level overview of some of the other kind of cultural experiments that you guys have run with other organizations. I had a look through the Tracing the Wild initiative, which I thought was very mm. interesting in terms of the way that this data was being surfaced. But um, what else is out there? Maybe just super high-level top view so people can see the kind of landscape of cultural experimentation that you guys have do- dove into. Sure. I, th- I think I would, I would love to bring the Tracing the Wild experiment and explain it that way because yeah. it was such an incredible project project that we did and it's it's one of these art projects the only art projects I think I've been really involved in, in my life and it was <laughs> such an nice. amazing experience so 
the um, this is a branch of SNI that is right now we're so fully focused on mm. the methodology, the technology, the the creating these these assets and bring value to it that we sort of put it on pause. Yeah. Um, but the art is always embedded in the in the assets that we develop. So mm. you can see with the Sub Zero, for instance, um, example how we have created. Um, these beautiful point clouds representations of a dolphin mm. that then uh, the community that receives it um, would you know appreciate and this is kind of like what we're trying to do when we create a derivative okay. of the data we wanted yeah. to make it um, appealing to the receivers sure. the community receiving it um, another example of art embedded in inside this uh, ecological assets that again that serves a certain purpose is we are creating um, with a wallet connect mm. project that is supporting these aqua search organizations oh, cool. I was just talking about Super interesting. Uh, through bioacoustics we are creating we're generating uh, art basically yeah. through these um, the clicks and whistles from uh, sperm whales and humpback whales. Oh, really nice. So you, That's when you super receive, cool. Yeah, Input so. for generative art, really nice. Yeah, so basically you will receive these ecological assets that are proof of your contribution, but within that there's an NFT mm. that is um, that is g being generated through the sperm whales by acoustics. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and you will be able to also access the raw, uh, you know, uh, Acoustic data, which is, yeah. uh, I mean, for a nerd like me, it's an amazing thing. Some <laughs> other so people cool. think like, "Well, this is just like noise," but sure. Um, know, yeah. But it's you know, this this is the type of uh, art that we still are doing, despite being going maybe more like the the, the <laughs> business route, if you want to call mm -hmm. it, the more strategic routes, let's say. Yeah. But the going back to the tracing the wild what was very powerful about that project is that it was an incredible collaboration between like very different artists with the intention of using art to tell these very complex stories about human wildlife mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. coexistence or conflict in okay there. interesting so we took uh, data from three different uh, lionesses that had a gps track mm -hmm. and and um um, artists basically used this data to to create a map whereby you could see how close these lionesses, these three lionesses, were um, getting to uh, to households of people. Okay, okay. These were both a digital art version and a physical art uh, that Chuma Nagbado, a Nigerian artist, has created. That was then uh, presented and showcased at the Nairobi Design Week mm. in uh, March. Nice. And what um, what that and I was there at the launch and I was there when people were looking at it and people were you know Nairobians from the city uh, um, Kenyans that you know even though this ecosystem was like thirty minutes away mm. by by flight or uh, a few hours away by car from them they had no idea that this was happening mm. you know that. Mm. Every few days, uh, a Maasai community loses their, you know, parts of their livelihoods, like a cow or sheep, mm. Mm. because of um, uh, a predator basically oh, wow. getting their 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 the cows and so on. So this and the conflict what creates is sometimes retaliation, so yeah. killings or poisoning of lions, which then has cascading effects on. You know, scavengers, animals that eat on the poisoned carcass and also die and so on. Gosh. So it's very bad. Um, so this was like, how can we use th this project, The Tracing the Wild, was how can we use this um, art medium mm. to tell stories, com very complex stories, like such as the human wildlife conflict story in mm. uh, um, in Kenya, in the Masai Mara. There was also an audio uh, mm -hmm. recording and a playlist sort of made uh, through interviews that I myself and uh, and the Kenya Wildlife Trust have collected in um, uh, from communities okay. uh, that live close to the predators asking questions such as like what is the value of a lion to you yeah, yeah. and um, and then mixed that and created NFTs uh, songs basically <laughs> super uh, interesting uh, man yeah, yeah. so I mean what is, like what is the solution now you know if there's human communities living on the edges of these areas where there's lions prowling 
like how how do those two communities coexist, and yeah. how does raising capital um, for the Kenya Wildlife Trust support that? Because I think that's what we're looking at here: is you know humans are increasingly infringing upon nature um, and the boundaries. So, like, what what's the hypothesis on how to address this? Yeah. So for for the Kenya Wildlife Trust through the Munsama, uh, call it crowdfunding or funding. Uh, uh, Project initiative. We managed to raise a hundred thousand. Uh, uh, That's amazing. Dollars. So That's that was awesome. that was the first during a bear market. <laughs> yeah. No, that was that was pretty crazy. That's so cool. <laughs> and um, the community loved that. Yeah. So this was uh, this was a big the, our first let's say POC that we launched, uh, and it was so successful that then we decided to like okay we gotta we gotta. Um, do this more with other organizations, looking at what type of communities they 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 they, they work with and yeah. what type of assets we can create that are appealing to to mm. them. Mm. So with this, but cutting it short, <laughs> this uh, this money, what uh, what the Kenya Wildlife Trust did was they uh, they've hired a new ranger. They bought a car that would allow them to reach more. Um, more of the uh, the areas, especially okay. the hotspots where where conflicts are happening, they okay. could not reach because they just didn't have the capacity right, for that. Right, right. Um, they hired a consultant uh, on lion ecology to give them advice on on, mm-hmm. uh, on specific um, uh, research they wanted to do. And basically, right now, what they are producing in terms of impact is to show us how targeting different communities and basically addressing conflicts okay. so you would, okay. they would go with the with with a vehicle to do weekly surveys around places where a conflict happened to understand the reaction of the communities uh-huh. towards the conflict and um what was there not in place that would pre- would have prevented it so okay, some of the solutions that are the most effective are really not uh they're really not sexy, you know. Like, yeah, there's no, there's no, <laughs> yeah, there's sure. no, like, there's no, <laughs> there's no, like, I don't know, special drone or AI solving no, that. It's like reinforcing the bomas, as they call them. So mm. reinforcing the fences around yeah. the, the cattle where they sleep at night. Yeah, because yeah. lions are, you know, night hunters. So yeah, totally. Or at dawn, so like they would just, mm. if you haven't created a, a good fence around yeah, the cows totally. where they sleep, they will come in and. Of course, know, yeah, yeah. As simple as that. Reinforcing, they showed that reinforcing BOMAs will um, um, will drastically decrease reduce the incidence, reduce the, the incidence, and this is one of their uh, their goals because the two yeah. threats. So in, in our let's say reporting model, we always want to show what is the what are the main threats, the direct threats to the population of, or or the ecological focus mm, mm. as we call it so like the can be a community it can be a population what are the direct threats and how is this project trying to alleviate those threats or abet them mm. completely and um, for them the goal is yeah to reduce human wildlife conflict and another threat they have is habitat loss so we decided to focus on a project that would allow them to monitor spaces that they haven't monitored but that are hotspot for human wildlife conflict and then for them to address at least 75% of yeah. the reported conflict so that they can understand right, 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 what right. type of policies they can suggest in the future. Um, the Kenya Wildlife Trust is also very connected to, to the government, they collaborate with the government yeah. so they can influence policy through the scientific research, which is um, nice, nice. what I found is a lot of the conservation work is doing, is like trying to prove certain threats strongly through sen- rigorous scientific Research and outcomes, so that they can afterwards yeah. influence policies in, in, in regards to conservation of uh, species and ecosystems. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. I think going all the way through to better understand, yeah, what this means by human wildlife conflict and kind of witnessing these two keystone species, lions and then people, obviously. And I could be totally sympathetic to, you know, the gentleman or the family who'd lost their cattle to um, a lion, you know, and the kind of natural desire to retaliate. And yet 
I think it's interesting that this organization is kind of continuing to show up in relationship and community to really help circumnavigate this conflict. Um, uh, first thing that came to mind for me was fences. Like these are very simple, as you described, not sexy. But also there's this kind of emotional response that we have um, if we're responding from a place of separateness and otherness and, oh, like this other thing took something from me as opposed to like, oh, actually this is a part of life and balance and nature and I need to be more responsible for, you know, the way that I am stewarding my own resources because this is the way that life works. Life begets life and death is a part of it. And so um, I think it's, yeah, a fascinating kind of microcosm for this broader picture of humanity really grappling with um, this age-old story um, that we've been telling ourselves around man against nature as opposed to man a part of nature. And uh, I'm curious, it seems like you've covered a lot of ground over the last 18 months. Um, I can't believe it's only been that long and you guys have raised as much money as you have for these organizations and pretty rough macro economic <laughs> conditions and crypto conditions as well. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen that give you the most hope and bring the most optimism towards the work that you're doing conservation. Yeah, so one one thing that came to mind when you mentioned is like, you know, human human non human uh, conflict uh, conflict of friction, right? And like seeing ourselves as not part of and um one of the one of the things because I I'm the one reaching out to conservation organizations and, yeah. you know, closing those partnerships. One of the things that I um, always ask themselves, uh, I always ask, ask them is, um, how do you include the human in everything that you do, yeah. like in conservation work that you do? And some some of them, like the Kenya Wildlife Trust, has specific community outreach programs, community-led conservation programs where they hire the people uh, totally. to do conservation work. Um, others include in their threats model threats to human well-being of yes. their actions, right? So you look at the threat to the ecology, to, to a species. You look at how this intervention is helping the, the non-human and you're sure that it's going to help the non-human, but how is it impacting mm. the life of people living 100%. around, right? So this type of considerations is something that we want to ask and we want we, pr we expect from the organizations that we work with to have at least... A consideration in the theory of change okay, and okay, the project that is included, the social part sure. of it. And seeing this movement moving forward gives me hope. Nice. In terms of like how, what is the vision on sure. in this, you know, let's say stewardship world? Is it about saving species so that we can send tourists to go look at these pretty lions? Or we're actually really moving towards. Uh, creating the conditions for coexistence between humans yes. and wildlife in 100%. an expanding population, and, and, totally. and uh, you know, um, how can we rewild cities? Like, I mean, this is not necessarily SNI's focus work, yeah. but or you know, urban. But, but we started sort of there. So, oh, urban, yeah. yeah. So, urban rewilding. Like, how can we bring nature closer to? to us mm. and what are the conditions again that we want yeah. to set to make that happen because we know that living with wildlife costs yeah. i mean you lose things you yeah. <laughs> you know the a monkey takes takes <laughs> takes food from your house and like you know there's there's there is a, a friction that we don't yeah. want to completely eliminate what we've done we've yeah. tried to eliminate it like building fences that yeah. those fences are too expensive to keep up first of all and they're not effective yeah. because the long term and the long term you won't be able to enforce all the mm. time that, and actually, is not good for the for animals as well because it <laughs> it locks them into yeah. closed ecosystems and so on. So I mean, the hope is that yes, the biodiversity conservation movement is moving towards answering the bigger the bigger questions through yeah. their strategies, which yeah. is like how can humans and wildlife coexist. Another just quickly, I, yeah. I just want to touch on that. I think I think it's a fascinating idea. I mean, I'm obviously new to this space and I haven't gone into it, but having kind of a human centric biodiversity conservation model is a really interesting concept. Yeah. I was talking to Greg from uh, Pachama who described you know working in fisheries and organizations being very tempted to just come to fishermen and say, "Don't fish here," you know, and yet 
it's not a practical model because this is how people survive. Mm-hmm. And if you begin to look at humans as you know just an element in the ecology, as a keystone that has particular needs, particular patterns, motivations, it becomes yeah a very different way to approach this challenge. And I, I personally am very yeah sympathetic um, as a father towards just that deep instinctual need to survive and to provide for our next of kin. You know, this is runs in our blood. And yeah, also recognizing um, the conflict and the tension that happens when we run into wildlife. And you just used the example of a monkey stealing things. Um, but this is also what happens when we're with other people. Community is hard. Relationships are hard. You know, love often brings pain. And yet um, we found, especially through the pandemic, this intense loneliness and isolation and being separated from one another. And I think this is very much you know, expression of the separation of nature. Mm-hmm. And so I love this idea of bringing wildlife into cities and bringing, um, you know, the wilderness back into our life. It's something I feel very deep calling for right now is to actually just immerse myself in the wild because at 33 now years old, I've never done it. You know, I've always lived in environments where there was that nice square box <laughs> to return to. And so I think that's a very interesting kind of pinnacle concept as you guys are obviously on the very edge of this movement, really pushing so many different boundaries and have worked a lot with amazing communities. And you guys have done several hackathons to really, you know, ideate and generate concepts around this. But for me, this this feels very, very fascinating and very promising and also something that I've, seems like people could get behind more um, as, a, as a mode of... Yeah, valuing actually harmony in nature where humans can coexist as an intricate part of this ecosystem and to really shift away from this conflict. So just wanted to provide yeah, some kind of thoughts and narratives. Um, you were just about to move on to a second piece of yeah, what you've experienced that was giving you a lot of hope and optimism hope. in this space. Sure. Actually, I've, yeah, I, I can share a thought that came to mind now that you were sharing yeah. um, in terms of like, intrusion of wildlife into somehow a space that we have created <laughs> in the West, especially yeah. as like a protective thing. There's mm. a wild there and there is us here. Um, what we're seeing in Europe, right? Like so in, in continental Europe, a lot of the wild big mammals have disappeared and now mm. through different programs um, like rewilding, retroduction of, mm. of species, yeah. we're seeing a comeback of the wolf the the big so the big carnivores the wolf the bears and so on and they're creating conflict and so on mm. in other areas we introduce grazers like so one of our uh, partners is rewilding Portugal in the north there as they reintroduced um, taurus and wild horses to increase the diversity of grazers in the in that ecosystem cool. to help the regeneration of the ecosystem why am I sharing this is because especially in Europe we're seeing this this friction of mm. like now wolves are getting into people's farms, sure. which they didn't do in, in, in maybe the last generation ever, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we have this new, thing. although this was an old problem, I yeah. mean, not a problem, but it was an old relationship, I would yeah. say. Yeah, relationship, totally. Between, <laughs> you know, humans and uh, there's <laughs> histories that you can go read, you know, yeah. like how, how people dealt with this. And yeah. now it's new and is oftentimes perceived as... Um, you conservation organizations have brought this. This is your animal. Go, ca- go catch it. Or you'll find a solution. Like we want, right? <laughs> As, no, but, yeah, but yeah. you understand like that is totally how right. the perceptions is, is wrong, right? On, on like how, yeah, how yeah. This, these animals are almost seen as pets, right? Because they're being reintroduced or they're being right. facilitated to come to a new place. Right. That <laughs> Take uh, your pet, some, wolf. Yeah, I mean, sure, like with uh, WWF Romania, with whom, with whom we will launch a really interesting POC next year, they they were introduced the bison uh, around 10, 12 years ago in, in Romania. Um, and yeah, they were telling me stories of like, you know, uh, farmers that had like a bison rocking up in their garden, in their <laughs> apple, uh, you know, orchard, yeah. um, orchard and... Um, uh, say calling them like, hey guys, your bison is here. Come <laughs> get it, you know. <laughs> uh, so and why bison. and why I'm, again like why I'm sharing this is that a lot of these rewilding projects, their goal, the long term goal, is to 
let nature take care of itself mm. as as we have created the conditions for humans to coexist with this this new well, well not new but reintroduced species yeah they want to obsolete themselves and this is kind mm. of like the mm. the hope that I'm hearing from the most earnest scientists conservationists conservation practitioners I heard it from two of them they told me you know at the, at the end of the day my uh, my success in the long term will be um, um, <laughs> verified when I have I've obsoleted myself from this ecosystem. So when I've done the work to then move away from it, yeah, right? Totally. And this is so important. No, we don't want to create dependencies either wildlife or communities, uh, human communities there that we cannot let let ourselves you know go with our interventions. So mm. all the projects that I'm working and we are working with, I'm trying to always ask that question as one of the first. Like, so what is your long-term yeah. goal? How do you make yourself obsolete? How, do, how can you obsolete done? yourself? That's very nice. Because um, because at the end of the day, this is what, <laughs> what we're trying to reach, you know, mm-hmm. to continuously mm-hmm. fixing the, the symptoms yeah. of the problem, mitigation, right? Like, that's yeah. not what we're doing now in biodiversity. We're adapting. So interesting. And trying to create adaptation strategies that can last for generations. So cool. What came to mind as you were describing that is this um, kind of historical patterns that humans have constructed cathedrals and temples and beautiful structures as a home for worship of the sacred and the divine. And, you know, from the Enlightenment onwards, science became this. Um, new structure upon which to hang the mystery of the world. And I feel as though a lot of humanity has kind of augmented some of our own intelligence and processing to this big black box of science. And really we lose some of the connection to the lived experience of what it means to be human and just assume science will figure it out and technology will solve these problems. But I almost imagined, as you guys described this conservation work, of becoming architects of life again where actually we've spent the last, you know, however many millennia as a human civilization really depleting natural resources for our own benefits. And you can track in the fossil record, you know, the uh, extinction of large mammals with mm-hmm. human settlements. Mm-hmm. But what would happen if, you know, organizations um, are actually beginning to look at the future of human culture and expression? of really being an active participant in the cultivation of life and beauty outside of our homes. And this little moment of a bison showing up in our garden or a wolf, you know, coming into our farm is, is, yeah, it might be an initial pain point on the premise, but actually is an invitation to go deeper into this role where we're not just providing food for ourselves, but food for this incredible tapestry of life upon which we're just an element. And yet we're an intricate part of the whole. I don't know if you've had any um, yeah, cultural experiences or communities where you feel like this kind of work is being expressed really richly, this sort of artistic cultivation of life in nature. Um, for me, I'm kind of thinking, you know, indigenous communities have really been doing this for a very long time. But um, I don't know. It's uh, yeah, a bit of a future casting exercise that, that came up. I'm not sure if it resonates. It just, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I feel like we need a new story of, of human success in a way. Uh, right now, I'm I'm studying. Uh, there might be the next partner. Uh, the snow leopard case. Um, cool so, snow leopards. <laughs> and uh, and over there, they talk about. Um, I mean, there is uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, the snow leopard is seen as a, go- a ghost, like a spirit mm. that comes and goes that you you need to respect and protect and revere uh, because of these powers uh, that it has um, you know to to come silently within the village and steal every now and their ship but this is all faith based so mm. all the um, in specifically in Nepal uh, they're running um, a conservation program with monasteries uh, with Tibetan moni- uh, Buddhism monasteries w- that is called they're calling faith based conservation so Ooh, the lamas in this in these uh, villages, they inform, they, they, they work with the communities to basically help them perceive the snow leopards as that, as something to be revered, as something important for their livelihoods and so on, because the lama 
uh, is the the steward of the human community, but that human community extends to everything else, right? Wow, so, wow. Um, so this is a very fascinating story, but we haven't worked yet with this node upper, so I can bring you another one that I always use, um, the example of the Kenya uh, Kenya context, mm. because I was there. Like, sure, can sure. I, um, I talked to a lot of community leaders and so on. And um, one of the things that came out of these conversations is that, you know, Masai have been living with predators in general, not just like lions, but, mm. you know, uh, hyenas are actually worse than, than, than <laughs> lions in terms of like, they're incredibly opportunistic. So they also do a lot of killing, but the lion has a certain cultural uh, importance. Mm. And what they would tell me is that when I asked them, what is what does a lion mean to you? What is the value of a lion to you, mm. to these Maasai leaders or community mm. members? they would say that the lion means to them pride, means uh, protection, wow. it means danger also. And in the Maasai culture, you have a ritual, um, a sort of like a rite of passage mm -hmm. uh, for an adult man to become um, a, a warrior. And they need to kill uh, a lion. That would mean to them and to their villages that these men are ready to protect the village. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, from the danger, which is hmm. which is that the lion is a danger, but it's also a way, and this is something I heard from the community members, is a way to rem mem to remind the lion that the humans are also dangerous, right? So yeah. there was this sort of synergetic relationship built, whereby there was a killing every now and then, which had yeah. a cultural significance, um, significance um, but that created this respect mm -hmm. between humans and wildlife, you know. So we can see that as a bad thing. Although now at some point when population went down, which was mostly about habitat loss and prey and, and okay. so on, then the killing, the <laughs> cultural killing of the lions started to also become a threat because right. beforehand was was so minimal it was that imbalance. it was keeping the balance and keeping the lions also. I'm curious to look at, you know, as SNI grows up in its fullest form, what's it going to look like? What are you guys going to be? And what will be made possible in the kind of fullest vision of the work that you're doing? Sure. So as I said, you know, we, we are now in, in the process of uh, distributing all these ecological assets that are proofs of uh, contributions towards nature positive efforts. Um, one of the things that we want to do is to keep, uh, uh, expand the funds that we can access to, to then be distributed to uh, con these conservation organizations experimenting with different ways of distributing these funds from looking at UBI related to conservation uh, places, uh, what is widely called conservation basic income, you know, and all this type of like distribution uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms that we want to explore. Um, but most importantly, beyond the funneling the funds, and finding ways to distribute these funds in a way that is the most efficient and the most respectful of the people living with the wildlife and so on. And um, we want to see a community online yeah. being developed around, uh, or different communities being developed around specific projects and ecological stewards that are long-term committed yeah. to, to the work that they do and the ecosystems that they are trying to, to, to protect. Super interesting. So... We want to see, I mean, I'm, I'm usually carefully ambitious, but I can say that in the next, next like three years, you know, we mm -hmm. want to see a million people Amazing. Uh, holding these uh, ecological assets, engaging, participating with the work that these organizations oh, are, are doing. So nice. And that are, they stick with a specific project. Yes. They, they, they commit, exactly. So I like to call them like ecological committed communities, you know, mm -hmm. like a community that is following the slow process of regeneration yeah. of a certain ecosystem that takes long. I mean, mm. like I cannot produce an outcome about the grazer's role uh, in an ecosystem that takes sometimes 10, 20 years to, yeah. to, to produce results. So how can we create that commitment, mm. that committed support, yeah. which comes from funding, but also from participation with decision-making? Yeah. So this is the the, the long-term vision of SNI to look at like how online communities can become committed supporters of uh, offline field communities so nice. and stewards on the ground. Um, and long-term, to me, 
also would mean that this hope that I shared with you before, the conservation organizations obsoleting themselves. Yeah. I would like to see that happening in, in the next, you know, I cannot even say 10, 20, 30 years, whatever. Yeah, but the idea takes. of creating a support mechanism whereby mm. the people on the ground, the stewards, the communities on the ground are yeah. actually then able they're just incentivized as we created to do the, the work. Yeah. Exactly, as we've created the conditions for them to leave and we so give cool. them enough tools to compensate for losses and things like that, that they can actually do the work by themselves, the data collection that allows them to nice. monitor the populations they can Very do themselves. Because you know it, like technology is <laughs> is becoming so sophisticated what yeah. we can access as individuals and citizens that, for instance, uh, applications like iNaturalist are already, already used to do data collection from citizen science, mm. Mm. you know, type of initiatives. So this is the, um, the long-term vision of SNI. And it's almost an entire new profession to be an ecological steward and to actively participate in monitoring regeneration. And, you know, to be running experiments on the ground in your own community to see what works and to really learn and discover how we can restore these natural habitats. I'm curious for people listening who really resonated with you and your story and the work that you're doing at SNI. Um, what's one thing that they can do to get involved? Sure. Um, I think right now, really, we are trying to connect with uh, um, corporates, um, enterprises that are interested in getting involved with uh, conservation organizations and their work and supporting their work through funding. Super cool. So uh, you can reach out to, to me directly if you have any suggestions of organizations we could reach out to. Um, if you want to get involved with, uh, if you want to become a committed community member, mm. um, you can, uh, you know, reach out to to us and how you can, you know, get one of these these ecological assets that we're creating, uh, that we're creating right now. Um, usually, it works with, like, in the Web three space, for instance, if we're accessing funds from protocol, for instance they would then be creating the assets that then will be distributing to their communities. So if anyone is from a Web3 uh, protocol involved with the community and can suggest within that ecosystem a potential crowdfunding campaign that we could do with one of the ecological stewards that we have in our nice, really portfolio, nice. that could can be, then be spearheading this stuff. amazing. Yeah, fundraising uh, ideas why we can use Gitcoins or any type of like other Web3 grants to, yeah. to do something like that would be amazing because why yeah, Web3? I could totally see this. Why Web3? I think Web3 has showed us that communities can be created online around uh, an asset. Um, a sort of, and, and the story that that asset has from the board apes to, mm -hmm. you know, all other um, NFT uh, or, or currencies in general, tokens in general. There is some sort of a strange attractor that creates these communities, how can we bring more meaning to, mm. the, to those communities through, you know, biodiversity, yeah. restoration stories? Yeah, how can we bring more meaning? And also, like, these communities seem to be pioneering um, new systems of value. And if we can encapsulate nature as an asset and show that actually people do care about this and they're willing to put their money behind it, you know, this is a kind of far upstream signal to these corporations who ultimately are responding to consumers and shareholders. Did you want to drop a little alpha about what you guys are doing at Wallet Connect before uh, closing the show? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, the, um, what we are creating as a community um, development uh, a tool is called Real, uh, which is a registry for ecological assets uh, linking, basically. So we're creating a link between the funds and the data. Okay. Um, with the Wallet Connect project, what we would do is uh, Wallet Connect has uh, agreed to uh, allocate a certain amount of money for this conservation organization called AquaSearch. Amazing. That is, that is providing bioacoustic data from sperm whales and humpback whales. Um, what we will do with that data, we will generate uh, NFTs um, that are generated specifically from the audio. Um, and distribute these NFTs to 100,000 uh, customers of Wallet Connect, Super cool. who is launching um, a, a new feature in their, let's say, product, um, which is called the uh, uh, Web3 Inbox, which basically would allow anyone that holds an asset, like an ecological asset issued by, by mm -hmm. us, 
to receive notification as they subscribe to, to this feature. To receive oh, notifications exactly about a certain state change in their in their asset. What we produce in is ecological asset has data mm, inside mm. it. So a change in the data or a change in, in terms of uh, an update, for instance, that we receive the conservation organization will automatically send to the contributor, the holder of these assets, Super the cool. update. So they don't okay. need to check their assets every now and then to see what the update, what, you know, what's happening on the ground. They receive mm. these notifications by email. It can be an impact report. It can be, hey guys, we just bought these new hydrophones. Here is how we use it. As you know, raw as that, but they would be able to receive it in a very web two uh, way experience, yeah, and so then nice. go back to their assets. You know, so we are definitely using capacities from web three, but the usability and the access to through web two tools like emails. Um, good old emails, man. Never get <laughs> the over good old, yeah, the good old <laughs> emails. Like <laughs> my grandma knows how to use it. You know, yeah. so. Um, That's a game changer, man. I'm super excited. Yeah, so, to see that. and cool. we will have our first, you know, when I say, when I said a million, I know it sounds like a lot, but uh, no, if totally. we're already 100,000 uh, yeah. individuals receiving updates from the marine wildlife of, you know, Martinique that, so and cool. updates, and they can, they can be part of, you know, how these funds are, dis are distributed and what type of impact mm. in terms of policy it has, this is very strong. And it's again with not so much money. Allocated. Yeah. Imagine what you can do with more larger amounts, maybe mm. more projects that then are supporting totally. not only your monitoring, but it can be on other uh, yeah, strategies as well. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting design space here. I know we're just over time, but I, I love this idea of you know all of these conservation organizations surfacing structured data that you guys as an organization can help give increasing guidelines around what data is valuable. But really it seems, you know, someone like D Climate who's building this climate data marketplace could actually help to service this stuff programmatically to all of these other gaming communities and, you know, any communities in general who want to consume this data in a meaningful way and to be able to receive, um, you know, compensation for the use of this data. And I think really opening this up and making this data accessible as a, you know, building block in the new culture of this civilization that we're building together that's trying to figure out how to create harmony with nature is a really fascinating play. And you guys are building so much deep expertise and also relationships on the ground with these organizations leading this work. And yeah, man, I'm really excited to see what comes to the next cycle. It feels like prices are definitely <laughs> going up again, which is always an interesting signal. Um, and things can get a little bit stressful and hairy. Uh, just to close here, I'm curious what your personal practice is um, to yeah, stay centered and to stay connected to that kind of deeper sense of self. Sure. Um, well, there's, there's a few. Um, I think um, a morning, uh, morning surf <laughs> when yes. the conditions are out there. I live close by the beach, so uh, that's, that's usually a, a good practice for me. Um, I use the breath a lot to connect to mm. to to my heart. Um, there's a visualization practice that I think I was explaining in the um, yeah in, in the TED, TEDx about mm. kind of like connecting to to the world outside, seeing every mm. in uh, inhale as you know a gift uh, mm. of oxygen given to all living uh, living things out there, and the exhale as a gift that we mm. give back. To, That's so nice. To to life, you know, and like kind of visual, visualizing with every inhale and exhale, this type of like giving and receiving, mm. it's been very helpful in something that I would do when I feel a bit disconnected and so on, just That's walking so around or, or sitting behind my screen and kind of reconnecting to it. And um, yeah, there's many different ways, and of course you can go to the more extreme ones like free diving and so on. That's yeah. that kind of like. Uh, incredible disciplines and practices, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but I, you know, anyone can find find their own way to remember mm -hmm. how to belong. You know, like yeah, just a practice. Got to remember, man. Ale, thank you so much for your time. It's been yeah. an absolute adventure, and uh, looking forward to see how your guys' journey unfolds. Thanks, John. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Absolutely, my friend. We'll see you around. 
Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. I would be so incredibly grateful if you could leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. This helps us reach more listeners, attract amazing guests, and ultimately get the story of regeneration out to a wider audience. It takes just a couple seconds and makes a massive difference. Thanks so much. And do let us know if there's any guests that you'd love to hear from. We'd be very grateful to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.